and how it's going. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about railway oriented programming and JavaScript. I'm not sure if anyone heard about railway railway oriented programming. Uh, it's a kind of a new concept. It was popularized by Scott Blatchin, who's a, a F sharp programmer. But uh, JavaScript is even less popular right now. So uh, that's going to be a short introduction to what it is and why it would help you in developing your applications. So let's see. Let's see some example. What it is. Okay, here you go. Like imagine you are creating a an application that we do like booking doctor appointments. You wanna like you have a web app. Let's say you have some back end and the front end. And in the front end, the user or the future patient is selecting like a doctor. I wanna click this doctor. Yeah, with this time, have an appointment like next Saturday or something. And then, okay, that goes to the back end, and the back end receives like the user ID, well, the doctor ID, obviously, and the time you select it. That's the input for, for our back end uh, functional application. And what should we do now? Uh, well, we should validate the input, check if the user and doctor exist, good, obviously, and check the time. If the time is not occupied by another patient, maybe someone just booked that slot, time slot at the same time, who knows? And then when done, when th this is done, then we should update the database and create a, an appointment in the database, updating the, the, the doctor's database or the patient database. And then it's always a good idea to send a confirmation email to the user so that he or she can know, like can remember the, the booking. And obviously, in the end, the application should respond with a status, usually like, okay, well, that, the booking was done, or perhaps if there's an error, with an error status, okay? So that's the usual flow, nothing special about it. But okay, let's see how it's how can it be done in code. Okay, this is simple JavaScript. Uh, we have a simple function that's say that says book appointment, and it receives a request, perhaps from the backend framework that we're using, whatever it is. Okay, so first we can validate the request. Great. Then we can extract some data like the user ID, doctor ID, and the time from the request. Excellent. Then we're looking for for the user in the database and the doctor as well, and then we're getting the appointments, like a list of appointments from the database for the doctor and the user, and then afterwards we validate the time, seeing if the time matches. I mean, like that the, the time slot is is uh, empty for that point that we want to make, and when done that is done, we'll create the appointment for the user doctor with that specific time. Great, and then. Last but not least, we send the email to the user saying, hi, this is your, your new appointment. And eventually we'll just uh, return the status. Okay, so this is like very simple code um, and that should work. And in, and I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a happy path. So if everything is correct, there is no problem in anything. So this should work. However, like in the real life, it could fail many in many different places. Okay, because it's the real life. So what, what can happen? Well, the request may be malformed. I don't know, it's like wrong input, like some fields are missing, like the user ID or doctor ID is just not there. Could happen. What else? Uh, the user, the patient, or the user, the patient may not exist, and the doctor may not exist, who knows? And there may be some database error, connection error, authorization error, uh, many different kind of errors that happen can happen with the database. Or when validating the time, the time may already be taken. Who knows? And then when sending the email, this the mail server may time out or may not be accessible at all. So there are many possible ways to fail in this simple algorithm, right? So when you write a code like this, it can fail, and if it fails, then nothing will happen. I mean, like nothing good will happen. We just get an error or some even data discrepancy, possibly. So we need to like take care of the handling those errors. How we do it? Well, let's see. Just write some extra code. Usually some try catch. Usually some if comparing with null in this case, or getting some other uh, return codes. So you can see we just starting writing this extra code and it's not even fitting in the screen let's go to the next slide there's some more as you can see we just put like i don't know how many two or three try catch and uh, a couple of ifs 
Okay, good. Now it should work and the error should be code if there is any. However, if you compare it, the, the original one had just 11 lines of code. Pretty simple, you know? Pretty like I would say it's very legible. If you if you look at it, okay, everything is clear. And if you look at this one, well, it start to be, I don't know, just like lots of like code that should be there, but does the but doesn't give you any like real value. So that's the original solution again, 11 lines of code. And if you look at the final solution, we have 26 lines of code. So uh, that's 236% more. And if you like that kind of a solution that gives you like almost twice, I mean, more than twice the code, if you liked it, you, you can skip this meeting and well, work with you however if you want to have a smarter solution then yeah just continue so how can it be done in a better way let's see that's with the error handling with just 11 lines of code again what 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 i'm talking about look this is the the original one and this is with error handling with the same same amount of lines of code just 11 lines of code again so what's the difference i, I just put some awaits okay three await statements nothing else and this will also work without any errors. How is it done? Like, look, it's the original one. That's the better one. Okay. How can it be done this way so we can keep the code clean and have the or all the errors handled? All right. Let's see. That's the original one again. Okay. So let let me introduce you to the uh, like railways model. Okay. Imagine you have like railway trucks and a function that gets one input and Normally, like it gets, it, it produces an output, but in the, in this way, it can produce two kinds of output, like success and a failure. Okay, so it can either be a success or a failure, and we should model all our functions this way, and then link them together. So that's basically the idea of uh, of rail oriented programming. What is success and failure, by the way? Well, we'll see. Nothing really complicated. Let's see. Uh, Let's see how the functions are done. So we have the, the validating request. Okay. Um, how did, do you find this function? Well, you see above, I mean, I'm below it. You have to find if the request has some fields like user ID, doctor ID, and, and the time, you return a success with whatever true value. Doesn't matter. Could be something else. And else you return a failure with a, a, an error code. Okay. Good. That's a simple function. Let's go further. Then you have uh, some database uh, get user by id function so this use like the function usually get the, connects to some database driver execute some query and then gets a result and I, I guess it gets like it returns a promise because normally what what they do with like, databases like we work with promises so then if the promise succeeds we pack that into success whatever that is i mean like the user entity and if it fails we get a failure and says database error in this case. Okay, great. What about the success? Well, it's just a promise, you know? So the success, we define it as a promise. A promise like a resolved promise and the failure as a rejected promise. That's it. That's really the whole point of, of, of this exercise. We can use some other things. Uh, um, it doesn't have to be promised technically, but the promise is really nice in JavaScript because it's already there and uh, it works very well. You don't need uh, like an external library for that. Um, you need to learn any other code. You just use a promise and it works. Well, technically, yeah, it's called the either monad. Uh, like, I'm not sure if you know anything about monads. Probably not. Many people don't know it, but it doesn't matter really. We can call, call it as an either monad, use it as an either monad, although technically it's not, but um, it would work just fine. And uh, believe me, I've done kind a couple of projects with uh, um, JavaScript using those uh, railway oriented programming techniques and a couple of thousand of lines of code and backend and works very well. So uh, what do you have next? How do you link those functions then? Okay, imagine, okay, you have first the validate request function and then it can either give you a success, which in this case is a, a promise that, is uh, uh, how do you call it? Accept the promise, right? 
and or it can fail with a failure in this case a smartphone request and if it fails that all the other functions are just skipped so you go to the red truck okay the red truck skips all the green truck and you go just right to the end with the error you, you got in the first place however if, if you stay on the red on the, on the green truck you go to the, the second function which is get user by id and it can either uh, succeed with a success which will be the the user um entity or it can fail with database error and in that case if it fails then all the further functions are skipped and you stay on the red truck up to the end okay and with validate time the same so just link the, the functions this way and you get a, a nice railway model this way okay and next i have a live example for you um so uh this would be a uh, an actual example that I I did uh, like yesterday, and it's for the Pestle number validator. The Pestle is a, a Polish ID number. Um, so there's like an algorithm of how it works, and uh, the first step would be okay. So you have a validate Pestle function, and we need to know whether it's a valid Pestle or not, but not just like to know if it's valid or not, like true or false. We need to know whether it's valid and if it's not valid why it's not valid like what's wrong with this one it could be many things like okay input is not a string for example okay okay so uh it would fit the railway model perfectly in the sense that we we stay on the green on the green uh track and if some of the functions fail uh then we move to the red truck okay see how it works so first, uh, okay, we have this validate passive function, and first we check if it's a string, okay? Um, and that that function returns a a success if it's a string with this input as a as its parameter, or a failure saying it's not a string, okay? Good. So if it's not a string, we we skip all the other validations, and that's that's what the what the validate passive function will return. However, if it is a string, that we go further I will go just okay now we just trim it fine this trim function um it doesn't need to return any success or failure because it cannot fail it's simply like a simple data manipulation so for functions that do not fail we don't need to use a uh, success or failure the whole like uh the good point about promises in JavaScript is that when you use them um in in this flow then you don't need to explicitly put it some put something in the promise uh, you can just keep it as a like like a, a naked value in, in this way so it's a string it's not a promise of a string it's not a success of a string it's just a string it would work just fine because this is how this is how promises work in JavaScript so what's next uh let's see if it contains only 11 numbers okay so there's some simple um a reg regular expression that tests this input and then if the input is is that a string of 11 numbers then it returns that a success of that input if it fails then fails with invalid character okay what's text then extract the control number oh this one cannot fail because we we already validated that it has 11 num 11 numbers 11 characters so uh it doesn't have to be failure or success here what's next calculate the checksum that's the algorithm that I took from the like the official website uh, and it's calculated just the checksum and it cannot fail either so you have two of them and then the final check is if the control number is valid so we compare the checksum and, and the control number so if they match then there's a success fine and if it, they don't then okay invalid checksum there's a failure of invalid checksum and then well in the end we we just return the success of that person number so the, the entire function will just return the person number as a success of a person number or a failure of an error okay it will, will tell you why it failed if it failed you can also use the alternative syntax because you use promises so you can use the, the, the then then uh, then catch syntax and as you can see you start with a success because you, you have to start with success uh otherwise if you start with failure it won't work 
So you start with a success and then you check if it's a string, trim the input. See, and trim input does not return a success, but it works either way. It's not a problem here. And then you check if it contains only 11 numbers. Then the last function you can see, you need to write some, uh, some more, like some more code in the same function because the then catch syntax is not that flexible as the async await syntax, but they are equivalent. Like they are the same, like they work in the same way. However, one can be used for some things and, and the other for some other things. It depends basically on your personal preference, really. All right. So this is how it works. And then, um, okay. Um, what you get from, from this value oriented programming? Uh, First, you get clean and structured code. Let me repeat it. Let's let's go back. And you get this code instead of this code, right? So this is really clean, structured. You don't have these repetitive and um, um, I would say yeah, repetitive and uh, dirty code that you have to put somewhere. Sorry, yeah. Okay, what else? You focus on the business logic uh, instead of, of the auxiliary code. So yes, you stay clear of the auxiliary code and you only need to write when you get paid for it because while well, the client pays you for the for the business logic, they don't pay you for this error handling. Obviously, they expect it, but, but you're not going to sell it. I mean, like you get paid for the actual business logic. So you, you, you keep focus on that and it's really helpful. And then... Because of that, you get many small, easy testable functions. Okay, let, let's see again. See, you have many small functions. You don't get like a giant function like, like this one, when you have to put everything in a single function, then it's really hard to get, really hard to test. No, you get many simple, very simple functions. Okay, this one, just two line function. Okay, this one, basically one line. And well, and so on, like here. Very simple functions. Each function does what it needs to when we, what it needs to do, doesn't do anything else, and returns a failure and a success, and nothing else. So it's very easy to test and very easy to understand what if what, what if each function does. Because otherwise, when you have a like, giant one giant function, it's really hard to understand what it does, really. Okay. And then yes, this is very important. All the functions return the same success or failure structure what it means i mean like uh except for the functions that don't need to fail those functions that don't need to fail like like this function for example or this one they don't need to fail so they cannot fail really so we return whatever we need to return like a string a number or whatever but those functions that can fail they must return a success or a failure okay so you are sure that your function will return either of these things and not something like i don't know some really rare structure with some error codes whatever and that probably will be just used once and you will forget about it no you keep it simple you return a success or a failure okay now um i said you can use promises for that simply because um javascript has a, a good support for promises and then um, and it's already there you don't need any special library however there is a way to do it without promises. Uh, you need to implement it yourself or use a library with monads, like the either monad, uh, which perhaps we can do some other time for the next talk. It's a good idea. Um, so, but I, would, I wouldn't just do it like in production code. I would stick with promises and uh, it's the best solution simply because of, of, of the good support for it. And also um, like, it gives you the async behavior for free, which means that you don't need to implement uh, like asynchronous behavior to be used to, to, to be able to use railway oriented programming um, because the promises give you give that for free. Like if you just use promises, you get it included. So it's pretty good. And finally, you can get the async await syntax because you use promises or you can use the then catch syntax. Those two syntaxes are equivalent and they only differ in, in the actual syntax. And one, of, one is better for some things, the other is for other things. I have some personal preferences where to use one on the other. Um, 
so yeah you you do get that because of use promises and what do you have this do you have any questions by the way um it was a kind of short presentation but i, I actually when i run the presentation I, I really want to hear some questions so if you have questions uh i want to talk through this subject uh then i'm here to, to talk to you the other thing is maybe for some some future uh talk i would run this uh how to make your own either monad workshop uh could be interesting yeah if you feel like this is this kind of uh techniques all right so waiting for questions uh because well i just uh had a quick presentation and really want to hear from you what do you think about it have you used it in in, in the first place or perhaps you didn't even know the name of it uh, but you did you did use it So I'm not seeing any questions. So uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, well, it's interesting point of view. Uh, and I have uh, two questions. It seems like we forced uh, to uh, uh, make most of the code a sync to use this approach, right? Not really. You know, if you use a promise, then is like okay promise in itself is a asynchronous operation okay so if you use a promise then yes your code will be asynchronous but only like to the extent you want it to be like you don't have to await the promise like you don't think the promise will take some time to to be uh result resolved or, or accepted it could be like inst could be instantaneous like can happen in real time uh you use a promise like what i show you here uses a promise because it's like the easiest uh structure you can use for for this technique however you don't have to use a promise for that one and like you could some use something that's called either monad however it's not it doesn't exist natively in javascript so that's why i use the promise simply because it's there and i i don't need to use any an external library and by the way like if you look at it like from the practical point of view look mostly that's this technique uh it's for like backend applications when you have like a request and response so it in itself is a asynchronous operation you get a request uh you, you like your backend frameworks framework gives you a request and it awaits uh a response from you and it's by definition a, a asynchronous operation so it fits perfectly into that uh that flow simply because the whole the whole environment when you work is asynchronous so I don't see it's a problem using using promises here. It really works well. Uh, also, you said you have a big experience with that. And how do you uh, you write an util file which you import in every uh, component or other file where you uh, need the this thing... success or failure no. of you? Look, the only the only file I, I I import is is this one. Okay, this one. This is the only thing I do. Mm -hmm. that's the only thing yeah i just i just write five with two lines like this and this is the, the only file i import really nothing else that's the only thing you need for for that railway oriented programming if you use promises you can even skip this one if you if you want to write promise dot resolve and promise dot reject every time but i i just like okay why like just import this file really nothing else. That's the entire thing you need so that's that's like perfect if you don't like promises monads whatever but this one look two lines of code nothing else uh but you have imported in every for example component or file where you yeah. want to use it i create a file of these two lines and then i use an import like standard javascript import of this file everywhere i want to use like uh the success or failure objects right that's it's just this okay thank you and also it, this approach doesn't uh, solve all the issues and you still have to use try catch in some cases yeah you or... post right look look at the what can I show it to you look, look at this function for example well that's the okay this one so um yeah use try catch like 
in the outermost function possible, allow the most like like outside of it, uh, because yeah, here this function will get you a, a failed promise if it fails, obviously, and uh, so if you use it in, in like in, in backend framework, then your framework should take care of it usually. So you can just, you you have some error handler at the, at the framework level, or the function that called this function should take care of the failure of your function. Okay. It could be it could use try catch or it could be like part of a, a bigger thing. And that bigger thing could be could be some some other like railroad flow. And then on the top of it, there could be a try catch. But usually, like I mean, if you use uh if you use that kind of like flows when you have a request response, there must be a, a error handler somewhere, usually at the end, usually like like the most outermost function that catches all of it, right? So usually use this one. Okay, got it. Thank you. Sure. Sorry, I have also a question. Go ahead. Um, I have a question about why, do, why we need uh, a success status uh, because validation for me just uh, check uh, if, uh, for example, data pass is my function or not. Yeah. Uh, I, I <clears throat> in my opinion, I just uh, enough for just the fail status. Basically. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Um, simply for, for two reasons, really. Uh, one of them, if you look at the, where's my simple file? It's here, right? So simply because like promise.resolve requires an argument, okay? It will not, you can be undefined. You can even put undefined there, but it requires something. So you can either write the success function, rewrite this first line here as like result being optional. And if you don't give any result, just put undefined there that should work really uh but it's usually useful to return something it can be like true what I, like here what is it um uh, like here like true i don't know like i don't have anything anything more special here to return like i would i wouldn't use this true here like success true i won't use it anywhere look it's it's not using this return value next line and returns something else but just put something. I mean, like, if you rewrite your success function as like being able to receive nothing, so you can just find the find, that's good. But if you want to chain them, like if you want to chain them like with this then and then catch syntax, then you you get the benefit with returning like uh, to previous input, for example. Um, it's just more useful this way. So I, I try to have a success with something, even if it's like true. Because I know it's like, okay, yeah, visually even look, okay, look, looks like true, okay, fine. So helps even visually distinguish like success from failure. But technically, if you just rewrite this function, this one with result being optional, then sure, you can use just a plain success, nothing else, and that would work. Yeah. It's a matter of like con convenience, I think. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. And also, I have a question about. Uh, uh... If, for example, we need to collect a uh, failed result, uh, for, no, for example, we need to just uh, collect a validation a result, maybe calculate some calculation from errors and just show uh, without aborting our without throwing error and uh, throw only when we finish all our, our validation steps. Got it. So, um, well, the Promise in JavaScript, we use a promise here, uh, but we like it's an implementation detail actually, but we use it. Um, and the fact is, the promise in JavaScript is not that I would say I have some some problems with it in the sense that um, it's lacking a, a recovery function. It has a catch function, like catch. You can use catch, and catch will catch an error and uh, give you a a success. Uh, you can use that. However, it's, it's lacking a real, real uh, recovery function. But you can you can just catch it. So you can use await something, wrap in parentheses, and use catch, like dot catch. And then in dot catch, you can you use a function that will translate your failure into a success and return success from there. And that will work. So I also use it. I don't have an example here, but imagine you have await like let's say await check if contains only eleven numbers. You just put dot catch, and we'll catch the catch the error. 
So that means like you can go from from the red flow, uh, you can go from the red flow to the green flow again. It's also possible. It's not always that you stay like you stay on the green flow or you go to the red flow and you always follow the red flow. It's not always the case because sometimes you have error error that you can recover from. Okay, so use a catch for that, and it recovers from the from the from the red goes to the green again. So in the catch, use your own function that says, okay, I count this error, this failure, and let's say if it's something that I want to recover from, that I return a success, okay, with some recovery information. And perhaps if I don't want to recover from it, I will just return a failure again. Simple as that. So yes, you can recover from, from the red truck. Okay, thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask, did you have any issue with debugging such uh, code? I mean, do you, do you use in your practice some special naming of this failure errors? Because uh, as understood, if we use it, it everywhere then we can have some mess of these errors and how you debug such I mean, like, cases well, well when you have like errors like this i don't usually use strings as errors i use some like like more advanced structure like an object with some fields then they represent the errors simply because there are many of them so uh here it's a simple example so use strings okay because it's easy to to, to read however if you have like very advanced application with lots of possible errors, like hundreds of errors that could be, I would suggest use a use a, a error object that can collect all of these errors, uh, have it in one place, just keep it in one file, special file for errors. I was like, a, I don't know, like business, you can even divide it like business error, like network error, technical error, whatever other error, and have those like object properties mapped to some strings, and then you use that object as a as like uh like the error object wherever you use use failure you put that into the failure instead of a string uh just to organize your errors right mm -hmm. uh, yeah and who comes to debug debugging like like any any simple debugging works uh like any like if you use uh visual studio code for example you can use the debugger just simply because it it, it understands promises so it's fine Okay, did you consider to use some trace in these failures? What do you mean trace? Um, call, call trace of functions to quickly investigate where uh, where we have this failure. Mm, no, not really. Um, what I do usually is like uh, I have names like diff many different names for the for the errors, and then. Uh, when I when I come across an error, I know which line happens because or which function happens because uh, they're distinct. So it helps me. Uh, haven't used a trace, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you see, like uh, this example, very similar for me to uh, error throwing, right? And uh, for in JavaScript, we have error trace, right? So oh, you mean like, thought... yeah, stack traces? Okay. Yeah, yeah, stack yeah. traces. I mean, so... like you you get a usual stack trace because, uh, however, yeah, I mean, like uh, the, the recent versions of Node, you in, in those you can get uh, an async stack trace. In the, in the old versions, you couldn't, but in the new ones, like I mean, the last couple of years, uh, you can get the uh, asynchronous stack traces, and they are very useful for debugging promises. So yes, mm -hmm. you can use them very easily. And here, I do nothing to to like uh, destroy the stack traces. This is the usual promise, nothing else. So you get you can get all the stack traces you need here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, so, guys, if there are no further questions, uh, we can just stop here. And I cannot promise this one, but I, I would like to have another workshop. This, this time, a workshop, actually, a workshop with doing some code 